concept of rasa toidian concept of component instincts general psychoanalytic concept of affect can we navigate through these three and see if there is some confluence some parallel some potential of synthesis let's go into each of them and see how east and west the idea of rasa is central to indian psychology indian art indian aesthetics and the foundational work on rasa is done by bhartru hari some call him raja bhartru hari some call him rishi bhartru hari but is natya shastra lines out the basics of indian arts and aesthetics in recent times recent in the context of indian history from a european standpoint that would be ancient let us look at how we can look at the concept of rasa component instincts and affect when we try to describe any system from a structural standpoint we define few fundamental elementals and then we say these few elementals come together under the influence of certain laws and they in turn create millions of manifestations by permutations and combinations between themselves and between products of their creations color theory is a very good example of structural thinking of describing reality from a structural standpoint where we first identify a few elementals that are fundamental that are mutually exclusive and which cannot be reduced to anything other than itself any fundamental elemental we want to describe for any conceptualization must satisfy these three conditions one it must be fundamental two it must be exclusive of everything else and three it cannot be reduced further to anything other than itself let us come to the color theory we say there are three primary colors red yellow and blue so there are three fundamental elementals in the field of color red yellow and blue these primary fundamental elemental colors come together to create secondary colors and they in turn come together to create tertiary colors and it goes on all permutations and combinations that take place a tertiary can join with a secondary a tertiary can join with a primary a tertiary can join with another tertiary a tertiary can join with one or two secondary and one primary and these endless combinations going on and then we see the whole world of endless numbers of colors the same logic can be applied to the area of feelings emotions affects we can describe just as we have three primary colors red yellow and blue we can describe a few fundamental human feelings or fundamental human affects and then say all other affects are combinations of this fundamental affects or creations out of this fundamental affects so different scholars agree upon a different set of fundamental affects one opinion is that we have four fundamental affects happiness sadness fear and anger 
some people are not satisfied with this four fundamental effects they believe curiosity is also a fundamental uh, elemental some people say guilt is also a fundamental effect some add shame some add envy some people say envy is not an effect it's a state so where does a state end and an effect start all those detailed issues aside a simplified way of looking at a structural approach to effects is to define a few fundamental effects then say these fundamental effects let us say for example happiness sadness fear and anger nobody will dispute that these are fundamental effects one may dispute that this is not a comprehensive set of fundamental effects but nobody will dispute that these four are fundamental effects so let us say you have happiness sadness fear anger and a few more and they in turn come together to create secondary effects and they in turn come together to create secondary effects come together to create tertiary effects and then like in the area of colors we have this endless variety of effects and feelings one way to look at the world of effect let us also look at three words psychic entity any entity that exists in the psychological world is a psychic entity so it is not only affect for example thought thought is also a psychic entity and then we have state at any given temporal moment if we use various descriptors of all the thoughts and feelings and actions which are going on at a point in time they determine the state of the person and then we have the affect as we know it a technical word for normally what we call feeling or emotion so on the left hand side i have put a list of affect and different scholars different thinkers agree to a different set of affects as big fundamental effects so here we are trying to learn what are fundamental effects what are secondary and tertiary effects so if you look on the left hand side one opinion of scholars is that we have four fundamental effects happiness sadness fear and anger another opinion of scholars is that we have not four but eight fundamental effects so they include shame guilt envy and greed third opinion they include lust boredom irritation and inertia and fourth opinion they also include love power ecstasy bliss positivity and disgust if we define all of them and they come out to be mutually exclusive then it is safe to assume that most of these effects are fundamental effects so if they satisfy the three criteria they are fundamental mutually exclusive they cannot be reduced or deconstructed further into constituents anything other than themselves if they satisfy these three conditions then on the left hand side all that you see we can term them as fundamental effects and then you have combinations of these fundamental effects to give you secondary and tertiary effects i have put the word emotions you can substitute it by effects and you can see things like shyness enthusiasm feeling dull indolent the feeling of embarrassment the feeling of amusement shyness if you look into it it has combination of pleasure excitement and anxiety 
there is a combination of fear happiness of a particular type a sense of inferiority and a recoil at the same time a sense of something good something aesthetic and worthy of admiration if we look at amusement it has a feeling of wonder of happiness of intoxication of being besotted of being seduced of there being an element of humor so these are secondary and tertiary emotions now when we look at component instincts sadism mesochism voyeurism exhibitionism some will include narcissism you can see that the component instincts lead to many of the fundamental affects almost like these are tendencies to drive us to action to experience certain affects so these are more like tendencies put forward by desire to help us reach states of affects because that is what completes the psychic drive and therefore the affects then become the resultant variables the resultant the the affects then become states of they become the resultant states of an action one thing is clear the component instincts are not the same as affects but they drive us towards experience of affect coming to the idea of rasa very put forward in the fundamental foundational text of indian arts and aesthetics the experience of rasa as fundamental in art and aesthetics rasa is a concept which is not elementally fundamental in the sense if we take a parallel with the world of matter we see matter in three forms in the gross form as we see something by our eyes and something we feel by our touch with our senses as we know something in a normal everyday world so the gross form of matter then we look at matter at the molecular level and then we look at matter at an atomic level or the most elemental even the subatomic level or even the string level if you believe in that theory similarly we can look at experience also at three different levels a gross level of experience as we experience it and as we describe it we can deconstruct our experience into rasa which is a molecular level of looking at our experience and then rasa itself
can be deconstructed into more elemental bhavas the fundamental effects not all bhavas are fundamental effects some of them are we'll take a look at it in a moment but to draw a parallel we can experience matter or we can look at matter with our senses in an everyday sense we can look at matter at molecular level we can look at matter at most fundamental elemental level atomic subatomic as deep as we can go most elemental form of matter ideal is to look at matter at such a fundamental deeper level that we look at fundamental building blocks of matter which are mutually exclusive and so fundamental that they cannot be reduced to anything other than themselves so those elementals whatever they are they are the most elemental forms of matter similarly we can look at experience in the gross experience gross form of experience as we i and you experience something we can look at it in the form of at the molecular level of rasa and elemental level of bhavas some people even go deeper than bhava describing some defining something else but for our simplified discussion let us keep it as experience gross experience rasa and bhava so uh, experience in terms of the juice of the experience the relishing of the experience can be deconstructed in the form of a rasa and there are a few rasas that bhartru hari describes he describes the shringar rasa the juice of experience related to phenomena of romance love attractiveness and so on. and then for each rasa bhartru hari and others they describe a deity a being not a human being a supra human being and then psychologists indian psychologists take it further to put the rasa in the context of the chakra system and thereby tell us which rasa belongs to which chakra or two or more chakras and what are the colors forms deities associated with each rasa and which of the panch mahabhut is also associated with each rasa so we have the first rasa shringar about what freud would call the libidinal aspect of life the core libidinal aspect of life dealing with romance and love then we have the hasya rasa what freud would call a sublimated aggression into laughter and later on he would say aggression sublimated because of a confluence with libido or libido in confluence with aggression and then the two together the sublimate the 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 mixture of the two undergoing the sublimation the third rasa is raudram or fury or in psychoanalytic parlance it would be the rasa of aggression fourth is the rasa karunyam the rasa of mercy compassion and empathy less found in the freudian context more found in the cohesion context in freud we would have to conceptualize the our suffering self getting projected into somebody else and then by identification we feel the compassion the 
the vipassana rasa or the disgust or aversion this is a diversion from the classical thinking where even something disgusting is seen to be relishable in a secret way or in an open way which is pure pathology in the western context not so in the east where it is recognized as not admirable form of relishing but still a form of relishing very commonly found in human beings similarly the karun ras also has a difference of thinking where until freud gets into mourning and melancholia and starts talking about melancholia being relished we are dealing with a continuum of pleasure and pain a, a binary a brahmanical continuum whereas here the karun ras the juice of melancholy is also something to be relished and said then there is the the rasa of fear the bhayankam the experience abhorrible but yet an experience bhayankam and bibhitsam are experiences which we would relish most was would avoid but few those who relish are not excommunicated into the community of the sick and there is a difference of looking at those who relish this to rasas a difference between a eastern approach and a western approach the rasa of viram or heroism more describable in the jungian context the hero archetype at work and the juice that flows from actualizing that archetype adbhutam the rasa of curiosity of wonder freud would say in terms of component instinct freud would talk about scopophilia the pleasure of seeing something and voyeurism the pleasure of finding out and voyeurism sublimating into curiosity and curiosity into a sense of wonder and that activity the rasa of that activity the relishing of that activity or to use a lacanian word loosely the juisa of that activity i wonder how the word juisa can be used if not loosely so these are the rasas that bhartru hari described and one more rasa was added later by many people primarily abhinav gupta the philosopher and the thinker and the yogi in the form of shantam rasa or the rasa of peace the juice of peace which we don't find in psychoanalysis except a few a few times mentioned in uh, vinaycott when he talks about the capacity to be alone the capacity for peace and the capacity for bliss so these are the rasas described by bhartru hari expanded by abhinav gupta and these are the juices we extract from experience so these are not thoughts these are not affects these are juices these are psychological entities in themselves not fundamental in the sense of being atomic fundamentals but definitely in the form of being molecular fundamentals in the sense of the relishing that we have 
So when we look at relishing of experience, that relishing of experience can be understood in the form of this semi-fundamental molecular psychological entities. Coming to more elemental entities, there is a concept of bhava. So if we go back, say Shrikdar, the rasa, would have elements of aggression, of voyeurism, of exhibitionism, of uh, happiness, of pleasure, at times of uh, narcissism, these elements would be there in the experience of that rasa and the activity of experience. So the rasas are not in that sense atomic elementals. Getting more elemental than the rasa, we have the concept of bhava in the East. Bhava can be translated as feelings or feel in an etymological sense, not in the sense of everyday use of the word. So there is a feel of something, not the feeling of love or hate, but there is a generic feel of something. I touch this and there is a feel about it not necessarily pleasant or unpleasant or lovable or hateful, but the, the very act of touching introduces a feel. So there is a feel of interacting with every object outside or inside. The result of every interaction is always a feel and always a learning. Unconscious ceaseless processes goes on all the time. So, bhava can be translated into a feel and feeling in a very etymological sense and we have four kinds of bhavas described. The sthai bhava are the elemental permanent bhavas which are active to some extent all the time. And the sthai bhavas happen to be Love, humor, sadness, anger, enthusiasm, fear, disgust, and wonder. This is the more elemental Eastern theory of going deeper than the rasa into the bhava. That these bhavas come together to create the experience of a rasa. So there are five bhavas like love like fear, like anger, which on a continuum at some value are always active, never 100% deactivated. They may be insignificantly active, maybe 1%, 2%, we can't even feel it, but they are never 100% deactivated. They are never at zero. So sthai bhavas are those permanent bhavas, which are in a state of some degree of activation all the time from life, from birth to death. What those bhavas are, we will see in the next slide. Then, there are two vibhavas, the subject and the object, which is our self, who is experiencing, and something in front of us or something inside of us other than our self. The object, as we call it in psychological sense, outside or inside. So the subject and the object actually in their presence creates the bhavas. So here it's a more Kleinian approach where we state that there is nothing like a pure effect. It is the presence of the subject and the object which creates or brings into existence the effect. So the effect is mobilized consequent to appearance of the subject and the object. I have a different opinion. I do believe that in certain states of mind, pure effect without subject or object are possible, but that is contrary to this theory. Then we have the Anubhavas. 
the third type of bhavas or anubhavas the resultant bhavas which means after i relish the shringar ras what happens to me the resultant satisfaction that i got that i get after relishing of that rasa that resultant satisfaction is what is termed as the anubhavas and then we have vyabhikari bhavas which are 33 in number described and they contain states of anxiety depression and many of the pathological states we deal with in psychoanalysis so we can see the fundamental effects very near to the sthayi bhavas the kleinian concept of subject and the object which mobilize affect represented in the v bhavas the resultant affects like pleasure like satisfaction as anubhavas and the pathological states and some of the healthy states also as vyabhikari bhavas so these are different types of bhavas so as i said we can think of the sthayi bhavas the fundamental bhavas at the atomic level so to say which are never fully deactivated but at always are at some level of activation they are the ones mentioned in the list here on the left hand side in the bracket you have a english translation of a untranslatable sanskrit word obviously all these translations are loose translations there is something called the sanskrit untranslatables there are many good videos on this on YouTube by Rajiv Malhotra and he talks about how many of the Sanskrit terms are untranslatable into English and some of these terms have that character. They are really speaking not translatable. that the translations have been given in English and they may be loose but they are not completely off track. Substantially they do describe what is contained in the words in Sanskrit. So if we look at Thai Bhavas, they come nearest to fundamental effects. If we look at secondary and tertiary effects, we can see them as antecedent or consequent to rasas. One element that we get here is the fact of activation and deactivation, which usually we don't go into. It's a very important element in the human mind, how activation and deactivation happens. And unless we go into a deeper model of the mind and go into the manufacturing process of the effect itself, the activation and deactivation of effect cannot be dealt with. It's very difficult within the bounds of psychoanalysis to go into the issue of activation and deactivation of affect. For that, we have to get into the yogic model of the mind. And I have done that in my own model of the mind, where I have tried to bring together Freudian union and the yogic model of the mind, add it to the whole thing. And then in that context and the model, explain the manufacturing process of the effect. And when we get to that level of elemental description, part metaphorical, part experiential, part empirical, then we can bring together the ideas of Sthayi Bhava, the idea of Anubhava, the component instincts, and 
the fundamental secondary and tertiary effects. I'll take up that model sometime and once I take up that model, I'll be able to explain in details in the context of that model, how we can bring together the ideas of Sthayi Bhava, Anubhava, component instinct, create a new variable called resultant elemental and then describe in more elemental sense the working and the structure of the mind. Where can we apply this Rasa theory? Now that we know about it and we have opened up, you can go deeper into it. First is for quality of life. If we see some rasa missing and we can all figure out what is the right proportion of each rasa we want in our life and there is a deficit or excess, we can set it right to the optimum. So the first is the quality of life. You don't have to have equal proportion of all rasas. Each one of us will have his own optimum a la carta menu. And in that sense, we have to optimize subjective to ourselves. Rasa theory can also be used in the union idea of compensation. What Jung says, too much of something on one side become, brings about too much of the opposite on the other. Which means if the conscious mind has too much of masculine content, then the unconscious mind and the world of dreams is filled up with feminine entities. In that sense, the dream compensates for what is lacking in the waking state. The principle of compensation works according to you in a very strong way in the mind and compensation is a way to bring about a psychological homeostasis. So rasa theory can be used in the context of compensation to see which rasa is too much, which rasa is deficient and therefore which rasa is too much in the waking state, which rasa is too much in the dream state and is being used in the dream state too much out of an intention, unconscious intention of compensation. From psychoanalysis, ideas of component instincts affect Freud and Jung's model of the mind and other psychological concepts can be used from psychoanalysis to understand the whole Rasa theory. In which stage of life, which Rasa is severed more and how and why so? We can use analytic concepts to even explain liking of rasas which are not likable at the first instance, particularly the Karun rasa and the Bibhats rasa. Even the Bhaya, Bhaya rasa. So we can use psychoanalytic concepts to understand the phenomena of rasa at various stages of life, experiencing the rasa in various phenomena, conscious and unconscious, and explaining how certain rasas which don't seem relishable at the first instance, despite so, are relished. We can use rasa theory to depathologize many of the binary concepts in psychoanalysis, for example, depathologizing of melancholy and the relishing of tragedy, and not pathologize it as pathological masochism only, but to see it as a normal phenomena also and occasionally a healthy phenomena, and on occasion even a super productive, super normal phenomena. We can use Rasa theory and psychoanalytic theory together in analysis of art. 
we can apply the rasa theory to re understand or give a more flavor to our existing understanding of psychoanalytic phenomena for example what rasas are involved in the split position in the depressive position what rasas are involved in the oedipus what rasas are involved in manifestation of each of the archetypes how can shanti rasa be used for relaxation for peace and for general enhancement of health of the mind and we can use both together to study epistemology or to bring epistemology into rasa and psychoanalysis analysis of rasa and psychoanalysis or bring all the three together psychoanalytic concepts the concept of rasa and the concept of epistemology particularly the kantian epistemology and from there construct a more comprehensive model of the mind construct a more comprehensive explanation of standard classical psycho psychoanalytic phenomena be it of split of archetypal manifestation of creation of the cohesion self of creation of vinegar's true and false self or living of them or the kleinian concepts of split or the depressive position so if we bring together psychoanalytic concepts rasa theory epistemology spiritual concepts we can enrich and create more comprehensive model of the mind more comprehensive explanations constructions of psychoanalytic concepts and thereby uh, more comprehensive and clear understanding of pathogenesis and therefore a road to healing